Yes, we will. And yes, we did vote for humble Julia. Too humble to compare herself to Ben Chifley or Barack Obama. Clearly, Julia doesn't want to appear to have ideas above her station. What did she think we were going to say? Geez, you're up yourself, Jules. Who do you think you are? The Prime Minister or something? But no, Julia would, not, would presume to be neither a statesman nor an orator. The question I want to ask is why not? Do we not deserve such a leader? And today, I want to mount an argument that if only our leaders had an interest in the arts, we might see some qualities which we could call leadership. For my money, this was the worst election campaign in living memory. Fascinating, but bad. Admittedly, on election night, the count itself galvanised over three million people watching it on telly. But in the lead up, the general sense of ennui in the electorate was palpable, summed up by my fishmonger at the Vic Market, who said, Yadi ya, who cares? We either get Dumbo or Pinocchio. What's the diff? And truly, that view, what's the diff, was played out in the voting. At one stage, during the counting in the weeks after the election, the Electoral Commission had a margin between the ALP and the Coalition of just eight votes. Eight votes after 14 million people had voted. Incroyable. The first thing to be said, reflecting on the campaign, is that there is something profoundly innovating about the relentlessness of opinion polling. My friend, the cartoonist Judy Horacek, said, it's like obsessively weighing yourself, jumping on the bathroom scales day and night when you're trying to lose weight, dispiriting and ultimately futile. There have been a squillion corporate weasel words spoken and written about leadership, and I don't propose to bang on about it here for too long. But just to observe that during the election campaign, we were all longing for a glimpse of it. So what were we hoping for? Did either party deliver? And what is a leader? Admittedly, there are a whole lot of words we could toss around that purport to be the must-have qualities of a leader. Vision, integrity, charisma, dedication, generosity of spirit, openness, humility, fairness, creativity, a sense of humour, self-belief, so on. Remember primary school, there were kids who went, hey, let's go to the shelter shed. And everybody in the group goes, yay, great idea. And then there were those who said, hey, everyone, I've got a good idea. Let's go to the shelter shed. And everyone in proximity goes, get lost, dickhead. What is it that the first kid has that the second kid doesn't? And can we learn how to get it? Both the business community and private schools are very big on this. Naturally, they have to believe that you can acquire it. This, their, their core business depends on it. Uh, the concept of a leader is synonymous in a lot of people's minds with a bigger salary package, power and perks. Private schools are always marketing themselves as places where students can learn to find the inner leader leadership qualities within. At Melbourne Grammar, I noted that they even have a director of leadership. A friend of mine went there, and once I asked him if he'd been taught at school um, how to prepare for a job interview, and he said, don't be ridiculous. We didn't need to prepare for job interviews. We knew we'd be conducting them. <laughs> when I went to school, we didn't really have a concept of training people for leadership. The emphasis was on citizenship. In fact, my brother won the citizenship prize and that just proved what a jolly sterling fellow he was and we were very proud. The kids who went after leadership, the prefects, were in my mind either sucks or bullies. But that was the 70s. I'm going to talk about three qualities which I think are essential to political leadership. 
imagination, language and performance. Qualities, I might add, that are critical to arts practice. So let's start with performance. Come election time, we need our politicians to understand implicitly what an election campaign is for. And that is the opportunity to persuade us that if we vote for them, together we can make a better world. It's their role to persuade us that they have imagined what that world might be, that they have the capacity to describe it. And then they have to convince us that they know the path and they will lead us along it. Imagination, language, performance. This is the stock in trade of the arts, the theatre particularly. These people, our politicians, are engaged in the theatre of politics. They are actors on a political stage. So why not admit that the task at election time is that of being an actor? Now I can hear you protest. No, 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 we already had phony Tony and fake Julia. We want our politicians to be real people. But let me stop you right there. Acting is not about faking it. Acting is not about being a phony. In fact, the opposite is true. Acting is about committing to the truth of a character. Moment to moment, feeling to feeling, impulse to impulse, intent to intent serving the imagination and language of the text to create authenticity in performance. And indeed, during the election, that's what the minders tried to manufacture. This campaign was marked by a desperate drive for authenticity. We watched them create what Louis Nara once described as a willy-willy of spin in order to create the effect of authenticity. When the spin doctors or Julia herself woke up to the fact that she was sounding like an automaton, she announced that she wanted to show us the real person, the real Julia, speaking from the heart, as if having no notes at the campaign launch would demonstrate that. Off the cuff, fair dinkum, real deal, no intermediaries, Julia Gillard unplugged. But it's hard to create authenticity without substance. We didn't see performance. We saw posturing. We saw an actor pretending to be sincere and authentic, delivering sincere and authentic lines. Not an actor transforming. Let me explain. When an actor transforms, the character's outward actions are integrated with the character's inner values. There is an integrity to the character, same on the outside as on the inside regardless of whether he or she is evil or good or anything in between. This way, regardless of what is actually said, we can read the inner values of the character. Now, I appreciate Julia is not playing Lady Macbeth. She is playing Julia Gillard, but she is creating the role. Now, I'm not sure I can tell with any certainty what Julia's inner values are. I know she believes in education, giving every child an opportunity. I know she believes in hard work and rewarding those who set their alarm clocks, which is curtains for anyone who works in the theatre. And I know she believes in decency. But beyond that, all I can tell with certainty is that she wants, with every fibre of her being, to exercise power. And this is not a bad thing. Abbott wants that too. But we know more of what his inner values are, although, frankly, we find many of them unpalatable, so it's best that he keeps them in check. Barry Cassidy, in his terrific book, The Party Thieves, recounts how a former advisor told him, Gillard is clearly a spin doctor's dream, so focused and so on message. But the monotone, she and Abbott are the same. Why do they have to sound like they're talking to stroke victims? Well, I don't agree that they're both the same. Unlike polished Julia, who very rarely makes mistakes in her delivery, Tony has a problem of being a little too authentic for his own good. Shooting from the lip, as they call it. Running off at the mouth, changing his mind, making inappropriate jokes, 
and trying to earnestly defend his gaffes and overstatements and so on. So he has to go about concentrating very hard to keep the lid on things. And Barry Cassidy has this insight. I have a theory that Tony fears being interviewed because there's so much information and so many opinions hidden inside his head that must forever stay suppressed. <laughs> to set them free would sink him politically. So these two leaders have different tasks. Julia has to convince us that she is not just managerialism and marketing. Tony has to convince us that he is capable of predictable reactions, well-controlled emotions. He can be colourful in language and tone, but he has to rein in impetuous outbursts. He has to demonstrate gravitas. He has to show us that he is capable of maturity and integrity. In short, he has to prove that he is statesman material. Julia's task concerns me more. Marketing, as Don Watson tells us, has no particular concern with truth. And management concerns are relatively narrow, relative, that is, to life, knowledge or possibility. And that's a bit of a sticking point, you'd have to agree. A Prime Minister campaigning on grounds other than life, knowledge or possibility. Even the most bogan of focused groups must be alarmed by that. To be frank, I felt a degree of despair as I watched Tony and Julia strut and fret their hours upon the stage. I know that they're playing a role, and I know this because I'm a grown-up. I just want them to play their roles better. When you see John Bell play King Lear, you do not think, what a sham of a man pretending to be someone else, a king of all people. We don't go to the theatre hoping to catch a glimpse of what the real John Bell thinks about dividing up his kingdom between his three daughters. We know that he's acting in order that we can get what we came to the theatre for. Roller coaster emotions, insight into the human condition, social values held up for scrutiny. We want to have our humanity awoken, our compassion roused. We want to laugh at human folly, to be inspired by human nobility. Paul Keating said that when government changes, the country changes. He also said, in the prime ministership is invested in some respects, the ideal of the nation and its aspirations. So I believe this to be true. We invest the Prime Minister with the task of interpreting our national story. They frame policy, domestic and foreign, with an interpretation of our national identity. Even though Howard rejected that idea that leaders shape identity, we know how significant his imprint was. Renouncing the so-called black armband view of our past, putting emphasis always on continuities between the past and the present, drawing upon nationalist traditions of mateship and war and cricket to articulate a vision of what, must, what might bind us as a people, regardless of our ever-increasing diversity. In contrast, Keating had a very different and distinctive agenda. His national portrait was defiantly big picture. Embrace the Republic, engage with Asia, and work for lasting reconciliation with our indigenous people. Put simply, it's quite an important job. And whilst it is unfair to judge our current PM after only one month or so in the job, it would be good to hear her articulate a view on the national project that she envisioned. It would be good if she could just talk with the wind in her sails, uninterrupted and unmediated, rather than in the convention of adversarial politics which demands conflict and bifo and tedious point scoring, as though therein lies the path to enlightenment. So let me tell you what I know of actors. No one gravitates to a career in the theatre for the money. So it should come as no surprise that the theatre is one place where idealism still flourishes. It do does seem to me that the managerial classes and the spin meisters are doing their darndest to wring it out of every other profession on earth. 
but it does remain the lifeblood of the theatre. Of course, theatre people don't wear their idealism on their sleeves necessarily. In people over 40, that does appear somewhat unworldly. So um, we disguise it beneath a thin veneer of jealousy and meanness and sulkiness. But even among the most irascible, the most curmudgeonly, the most petulant, arrogant and grumpy in our midst, there is still a robust knot of idealism. In the theatre, and I have worked in it for 30 years, in the theatre you will find true believers. I believe that Tony and Julia have the capacity to imagine what a better world would look like. Personally, this time around, I thought that that imagination was a little small. What I don't believe is that they trust in the language to describe their vision. So for example, yes, we will embrace the new technology of the national broadband scheme. Frankly, this does not stir the soul. In fact, the whole yes, we will business was so derivative and impoverished as to be shameful and not to mention moving forward. In week one of the campaign, Kerry O'Brien took Julia to task, asking whether Australians didn't deserve better, commenting on the fact that Julia said moving forward 24 times in her opening speech. Don Watson said, these days people think the only way you can make a political point or persuade people of an argument is to treat them like imbeciles. It's like training a dog. And Julian Morrow of the Chasers said the repetitive use of slogans was known in political circles as the vomit principle. If you haven't said it so much that saying it again will make you vomit, you haven't said it enough. My favourite is the guy who tweeted Laurie Oakes suggesting that the ALP had bought the slogan, moving forward, from a company called Slogans for Bogans. <laughs> but if I heard the Tony Abbott mantra one more time, end the waste, pay back the debt, stop the big new taxes, stop the boats, I tell you, I was going to vomit big time. A classic American political maxim says, we campaign in poetry and govern in prose. I would settle for that. Imagination and language are inextricably linked. You could substitute the word vision for imagination, but vision is a buzzword which has been prostituted by corporate abuse in incalculable company reports in the form of vision statements. The concept of vision or visions has also been captured recently by Mary McKillop mania, hurtling us back to medieval sensibilities. So I prefer to say imagination is what is required of a leader because immediately I think of creativity, openness, empathy, possibility. This is why I go to galleries or concerts or movies or theatre. This is why I read. The most oft asked question of a writer is this, where do you get your ideas from? I wonder how often anyone asks a politician that question. Where do you get your ideas from, Julia? Where do you get your ideas from, Tony? Creativity is the ability to think differently, to get outside of that box that constrains solutions. The most important question a leader can ask is, what if? A noted leadership consultant, Warren Bennis, says he wants to publish books that disturb the present in the service of a better future. It's a sentiment shared by Hiram Smith when he says, leaders conduct planned conflict against the status quo. When you think of our culture of political leadership, you would have to say, that is just fanciful. What we see is cautious, constrained, focus group driven. Politicians say they want to think um, politicians say what they think we want to hear, or at least what people in Western Sydney apparently want to hear. How rarely, and perhaps this is just um, so too obvious for words, do you hear a politician speak from compassion or from passion or conviction? Oscar Wilde once said, those who try to lead the people can only do so by following the mob. How prescient was that? Let me share with you a very brief extract from one of my favourite authors, the playwright David Hare. 
He says, one of the reasons for the theatre's possible authority and for its recent drift towards politics is its unique suitability in illustrating an age in which men's ideals and men's practice bear no relationship to each other. And he gives the following example. A man steps forward and informs the audience of his intention to lifelong fidelity to his wife, while his hand, even as he speaks, drifts at random to the body of another woman. The most basic dramatic situation that you could imagine. The gap between what he says and what we see him to be opens up. And in that gap, we see something that makes theatre unique, that it exposes the difference between what a man says and what he does. If only politicians went to the theatre. It's dark in there. No one can see your face. And if you want to speak for the people, don't you need to know what the people's struggles are? If this is true as a nation and as a community and as individuals, that our ideals and our practice are drifting further apart, why would this be? I suspect, in part, it's a response to the drive to work longer and longer hours in an increasing competitive environment. Under these circumstances, it's very hard to derive meaning from alternative sources apart from the work situation. It's harder to achieve perspective. We're seeking wisdom and truth and meaning from more limited options, the business pages, for example. Ideals tend to be marginalised as we become more pragmatic, outcome-oriented and directed to acquiring more and more stuff. Our spiritu spirituality is devoted entirely to worshipping the David Jones catalogue. Our happiness is on serious decline and the public persona and the private person are at odds. Furthermore, the political landscape itself has been much sullied. I, I was very interested to re read the results of a trustworthiness survey. Respondents were asked to rate 30 occupations from 1 to 30 in terms of their trustworthiness. Politicians were rated as the least trustworthy. They came in at number 30. The respondents trusted politicians less than real estate agents, less than used car salespeople, psychics, mortgage brokers, CEOs and even journalists. Interestingly, and by the by, priests and ministers did not enjoy a very high rating either. They were at number 16 out of 30. People would trust a chiropractor or a bus driver before they trusted a priest. The occupations which we most trusted were ambulance officers, number one, firefighters, number two, and then mothers. What about this? Interesting. What about if we were persuaded to be our better selves and to think new and bolder thoughts? What if, instead of stop the boats, Tony had said, give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send these, the homeless, tempest tossed to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. This, of course, is the inscription on the base of the Statue of Liberty. Naturally, the word masses would have struck terror in the bosom of the opinion pollsters. Masses, hordes, we have a deep cultural anxiety about them. But perhaps if Julia had said, give me your tired, your poor, your future hard workers yearning to set their alarm clocks, <laughs> send these, the homeless, tempest tossed to me. We may have felt that amidst the chaos, confusion and rampant mediocrity, that there was someone who cared enough and was brave enough to show us the path and lead us along it. People often say that it's impossible these days to express deep feelings sincerely held because of the tyranny of the soundbite. When Jesus said, do unto others as you would have them do unto you, he was expressing the essence of the Christian religion in 25 words or less. That was a soundbite. When Karl Marx said, all history is the history of class struggle, that 
was the sound bite. As any good writer knows, if you cannot write what your novel or play or screenplay is about on the back of a bus ticket, then you haven't mastered it yet. Let me finish with a description of a new exhibition that opened last Friday in the German Historical Museum in Berlin. It's called Hitler and the Germans, Nation and Crime. And this came from the New York Times. The line had already formed when the museum doors opened at 10 a.m. An estimated 3,000 visitors paid to see nearly 1,000 items on display. Prosaic household items, mostly with Nazi logos and colours, photographs, videos, playing cards, stitched tapestries, a purse, a lantern and so on. Items that explained the early appeal of a man and a party that offered jobs, pride and a sense of purpose while employing wholesale violence and brutality to those who did not go along. This exhibition is about Hitler and the Germans, meaning the social and political and individual processes by which much of the German people became enablers, colluders, co-criminals in the Holocaust. The show focuses on the society that nurtured and empowered him. It is not the first time that historians have argued that Hitler did not corral the Germans as much as the Germans elevated Hitler. Hans Ulrich Tamer, one of the three curators to assemble the exhibition at the German Historical Museum said, as a person, Hitler was a very ordinary man. He was nothing without the people. The point here is quite simple. We need to take responsibility for who we elect to govern us and we need the arts to show us to ourselves. I am waiting for a time when our political leaders understand this and can express the importance of the arts as a core belief. Thank you.